All right, here we go with chapter number one from the Benko Gambit course. We're going to be looking at lines where white accepts the B pawn and accepts our A pawn, and they end up playing 7E4, whereas chapter two, we're going to be looking at G3 for white. Yep, so here, white starts with D4. We'll look at some other options later in the course, such as C4 and Knight F3. This is a course against everything except E4. So... Um, we'll give you a ton of weapons against those stuff. But here, we're going to play knight f6. So instead of challenging the center with d5, mm -hmm. like we did in the dynamic Slav course, here, we're going to play knight f6. And then after c4, we try to fight for the center with this move c5 instead. And this is a weapon that I've used over the board to help myself get to the national master level. And I really love the attacking positions you can get out of the Benko. So most of the time, you're going to see d5 here. Players push forward, close up the center. And if they don't play d5, we have sideline chapters. So chapters 3, 4, and 5, it's sidelines for moves 5, 4, and 3. <laughs> so you'll have those chapters. And now we play pawn to b5. This move is what begins the Banco Gambit. Most players are going to take. And then what do we do here? Here we play a6 and Gambit another pawn. But here, it's not actually a gambit, because once they take on a6, we can take this pawn back at any moment. Here, we actually don't take on a6, though. Here, we just play g6. So this is kind of a newer idea and a newer twist on the Benko. Uh, but we'll get into why we play g6 instead of taking a little bit later. So now most players play knight to c3, defending this pawn with the knight, also getting ready to play e4 for white. We play a bishop to g7, and what we're going to do is we're going to fight against white's big center with active piece play. So this bishop, really strong piece in the Banco Gambit, gives you a lot of long-term chances to apply pressure to that queen side. So think of this gambit as a positional, long-term queen side gambit, not your typical gambit where you're just trying to check, check, and check made on the king side. Yep, exactly. It's great because we are like never getting attacked. Our king is always going to be very safe on this king side, and that's part of what makes the Benko so, so fun to play. Um, but here, because white has prepared e4, usually they just play it because now it's protected by the knight. And now uh, we're in a, a bit of a not so tricky situation, but we have to make sure we don't get too careless here. Here we want to give our knight a square because white is kind of threatening e5 in a way because our knight wouldn't have any good square so for example if we like took on a6 here white could play e5 and our knight just doesn't have a good square it might have to like even go back to g8 because if it goes to h5 then g4 just traps the knight just like that so we have to be a little careful and make sure we just get our king out of the center as fast as possible because what this does is now after e5, we have this ea square for our knight. And we'll circle back to, we'll go, go over that in one line with e5, knight, e8. Uh, for now, let's look at eight knight to f3. So we're going to cover this in nine different lines. There's 10 total lines in this chapter. And here we play queen to a5. And a common question that you might be thinking is, why are we not taking this pawn back? And it's a small difference, but the reason why is when you put the queen on a5, you're actually ready to capture back on a6 later with the queen. And the idea there is you want the queen or bishop to cut all the way across this diagonal so that it's not so easy for white to castle. So keep that in mind. You start with queen a5. Now we're going to cover bishop to d2 in about five lines, uh, knight to d2 in three lines, and then we'll cover bishop to d3 in one line. So let's start with bishop to d2, most common. Mm -hmm. So here we just finally capture on a6 because now if white was to take on a6 now we're prepared to take back the queen and cut white off from castle so now is the time to take on a6 and then white plays bishop to e2 um if white does anything else like again if they take on a6 we just take with the queen and it's very tricky because it's hard for them to castle and if they play queen e2 um we're going to be pretty uh, happy with that kind of end game uh, after we trade. So after bishop e2, now we play d6. 
So d6 is just a common move in this line. It vacates this d7 square for either one of our knights. And it kind of uh, prohibits white from playing e5 for the time being. And one thing to note in the Banco Gambit, it's counterintuitive because we're down a pawn. But a lot of times we have Banco Gambit endgames that favor us. So oftentimes that queen trade is actually good for us. And your opponent may not know that if they haven't studied much Banco Gambit theory. Mm -hmm. So here we have castle by white. Now our recommendation is queen to b4. Um, this is something where just, Justin and I have gone back and forth trying to figure out what gives us the best winning chances. We really like this queen b4 idea here, attacking b2 and attacking e4. Pretty much everyone here is going to take the bishop, relieve that tension. And now we take back with knight, and white's got to figure out, how do I defend both of those pawns at the same time? Mm -hmm. And they take on a6 because if they don't, again, we still have this pressure here. So if they just played rookie one, we could just take on b2. So this is kind of uh, why this is the main move. And now white can cover both of these pawns with queen c2. So up till here, most of these moves are pretty almost forcing, not like necessarily, but like in a way they are because they're just like the best moves. They're the ways that we deal with the threats in the position the best. Um, so up till here, this is pretty forced. And now we just continue with our Benko pressure and continue adding pieces into the game uh, with Rook to B8. So now we're attacking this B2 pawn and white has to decide how to protect it. And it's, it's not so easy. And if you uh, are watching this course and playing a drinking game, take a drink every time we say pressure, because we're going to be <laughs> saying that a lot. Every move, you're almost always creating some sort of attack, some sort of pressure, and you want to watch white squirm. So if you enjoy playing over the board, the Benko is an awesome opening because now white has to put a rook on b1. And we're going to look at rook a to b1 and rook f to b1. Look at how all of our pieces are starting to get on attacking squares, right? You can see this pressure coming. Our queen's on an attacking square. And then all of white's pieces are going to be on defensive squares. That's the fun of the Benko gambit. Mm -hmm. right. So now we're going to drop our queen back to b6. And what we're threatening here is knight to b4 hitting the queen and the a2 pawn. So it's just threat after threat so far. Yeah, it's awesome. So like with whether queen on b4, really our only piece that's like not so great is this knight on a6. So that's why this queen b6 move is so strong is because now we're vacating the square for the knight to come. And uh, for example, if say they played like h3 and we played knight b4, they can't cover everything with queen b3 because we would just take on a2. And he doesn't have time to take with a knight because we would take his queen. So he would have to trade queens. And at the end of the day, uh, we're just winning the pawn and we're going to have a very nice position. So they pretty much have to play a3 here to stop our idea of playing knight before. And one thing with a3 in the Banco, you should almost always be happy when your opponent plays a3 because it softens the light squares. and you can. Pretty much always put a piece on b3 after a3. So here we go. Yeah. Queen b3. And in the Benko, we are happy with this queen trade. After queen takes b3, we're going to play rook takes b3. And now let's look at how to keep the pressure on. If white plays, for example, bishop to g5, maybe threatening knight d2 to kick our rook out. Yeah, so here what we want to do is just ask the question to the bishop, what is it doing on g5? Because g5 can be a somewhat annoying square because sometimes we want to move this knight. Uh, a common idea is to maneuver it to this e5 square, either through g4 or through d7. And we can't do that right now because he would take on e7. So we play h6 just to ask the question to the bishop and kind of give us the option of potentially moving this knight later. So here, what takes on f6? Because if they didn't take on f6, they would basically just be losing time. Because if they went back, we can just play g5. So taking on f6 is really the critical move. And then we just take back with the bishop. And again, this is a very pleasant position because this bishop is going to be a huge piece in this endgame. So now let's look at knight to d2 by white. And the idea with knight to d2 is they want to kick this rook out. 
we can play rook to b7. And you might be wondering, why rook b7? There's a whole bunch of moves for the rook. The main idea is we just want to keep this b8 square open for the knight, which we'll see on the next move. Knight to c4. And at this point, it does feel like white's doing pretty well. Like this knight's on an awesome square. We almost always want to get that knight off of c4. Um, but we have an idea here. We're going to play knight to b8. And this knight is going to route from b8 to d7 to b6. And it's going to offer to trade off white's best minor piece. Uh, the eval here is dead equal. And what are we going to do besides try to trade off that knight? What's our plan for the middle game? Uh, to try to put pressure on b2. Yeah. So we're going to just try to apply a ton of pressure to b2. And in practice, I think these positions are really hard to play for white. <laughs> And you should be having yeah. fun in this position. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to point out this like moving the knight to a6 and then back to b8 looks kind of weird. But again, anytime they play a3, uh, this is something we want to see. This is, you know, softening the light squares, especially because they don't have a light square bishop. It's a very weakening move. So we kind of force them to play a3. And now we go back to remaneuver our knight to a better square because we've already forced them. Um, to create a weakness, and now we can kind of bring our knight to a better square. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so let's now go back to move 16. This is our branching point. We won't take you all the way back to the first move in this line, just because we're 16 moves deep. Um, but we just played rook takes b3. We looked at bishop to g5. And now here, instead of bishop to g5, let's look at what happens if white plays rook f to e1. Sending this pawn and maybe creating a threat of playing e5. Yeah, rook f to e1 seems like more of a natural move to me because this bishop's already moved, um, but this rook hasn't. So moving the rook to a you know a natural square makes a lot of sense. And here, you know, White's idea is to play e5. So what do we do? We stop it. We play knight d7, and now not only are we preventing this, but we can bring our knight to e5 and trade these knights, which is a very common idea in the Benko is to trade this f6 knight for this f3 knight. So this is kind of the maneuver we're going for. Um, and here, white usually plays h3. Um, it really is hard to come up with a move for white because here, it's not so easy to see how he improves any of his pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, like again, this bishop could maybe come to g5, but like this knight, it kind of needs to stay on f3 because these squares are squares that we just have like total control over. So he needs to contest them a little bit. He can't move this knight because of the b2 pawn. He can't move the rook because of the b2 pawn. It's just really, really tough for white to come up with moves. So that's why kind of h3 doesn't really seem like it does much, but it's it's the most common move for white. And what we're going to play here is rook a to b8. Going back to that pressure concept, Double attack b2, ready to take it. Knight to a4 by white to defend this pawn. And now we play bishop takes b2. So what happens in the Benko usually is you reach a point where you have to figure out, do I trade in that initiative for material or some other advantage? Um, and in this case, we're going to take that b2 pawn, even though we're getting rid of that really nice bishop on g7. We know that in the end, this a pawn is weak. And we now have a protected pass pawn on c4. So something to keep in mind. You always have to figure out when do we trade in the pressure, the initiative, or material, or some sort of bigger advantage like a pass pawn. Right. Because this pawn is going to be a thorn in white side in the end game. That c5 pawn is just its so strong because it's away from the king, but it's so protected, and it, it can just really become the the deciding factor in an end game so this is why we're not super scared of trading off in this position so he can take our bishop with knight takes b2 but we're not super scared because we are winning the pawn back and this a4 or a3 pawn is is very weak so after knight takes b2 rook takes b2 we go through all these trades and at the end of the day White plays rook to a1, because if they don't, then rook a2 is already going to win this pawn. So rook a1 um, is, is already kind of forced here. Would you say this pawn on c5 is a storm in their side? Yeah. 
<laughs> it's Father's yes, Day, so I, I got a dad joke in. <laughs> Even though none of us, neither of us are dads. <laughs> okay, so Rook A1 played. Um, here we have a cool idea, and this is used quite a bit in the Benko. We can play pawn to F5. And what we're doing is we're actually chipping away at the base of this two-pawn pawn chain, trying to weaken the D5 pawn in the end. So let's say mm -hmm. E takes F5 by white. We're going to play G takes F5 back. Um, and we'll go just a little bit deeper to show what can happen. Um, let's show bishop to c1 for white. Yeah, so here we just retreat our bishop. And basically, again, just like Matt said, the, the idea of this is to chip away at his center. So here, we're very happy to trade, for example, this f5 pawn for this d5 pawn. Because now, we don't have one connected pass pawn. We have two connected pass pawns. And that's just, you know, an even better advantage for us in the end game. So after knight takes f5, knight takes d5, uh, we just have really good chances in this end game. Our king has a very easy path to the center. Again, our two connected pass pawns are going to be a, a great advantage for us. And his pieces, like this bishop on c1, like uh, it's, it's not really very promising. It doesn't really... <laughs> have a lot going on. So um, this is this is a great position for black. It, eval is around minus one. Um, but yeah, white, or sorry, black has very good chances in this end game. Yeah, I like it. So now let's go back to move 15 when we offered the queen trade. And we just looked at queen takes b3. Let's see what happens if white keeps the queens on the board with queen to c1. So the idea here now is we want to do that plan that Justin talked about in the other line. We would like to trade this knight for one of white's minor pieces. So something you want to learn in the Benko is how to be comfortable with all of these knight maneuvers because it's a positional gambit. Oftentimes white is pretty stuck for ideas. They're kind of waiting, playing passive. You got to figure out how do we maneuver these minor pieces to create the trades that favor us. And what we want to do here is trade the a6 knight for the c3 knight and the f6 knight for the f3 knight. That's kind of the typical plan. So we're going to start with knight c7, heading to b4 to offer a trade. Mm -hmm. b5, so I mean. yeah, we're, we're going to try to trade all the knights off in this position because we'll be stuck with, or stuck with sounds bad, but <laughs> we'll have this monster of a bishop on g7 and he'll have this it's technically his good bishop, but it's really not doing anything here on d2. So in the end, this bishop on g7 is going to be the deciding factor. That's what we're kind of playing for, because um, that's why we're trading the knight. We want this bishop versus his bishop to kind of be the the advantage that's kind of highlighted. And one, so after knight c go ahead. I was going to say, one thing I'll mention is, if you look at it from White's point of view, these are kind of the most active minor pieces, right? Those two knights yes. are the most active. We can trade those off. Okay, sorry, go ahead. No, you're exactly right. These knights are perfectly positioned. They're controlling the center um, perfectly, you know, as well as the knight can. So it makes sense for us to try to trade them off. So this is why we're playing this knight c7 to b5 maneuver. Um, and here, White plays bishop g5. Um, and here we could challenge with h6, but the difference is here this this queen is on c1, so that would not be possible because um, they would just take this free pawn. So h6 is no longer on the table, which makes bishop g5 a little stronger, but we just continue with our plan and play knight b5. So now after knight b5, we do have to be a little bit careful that this queen doesn't get trapped. Um, so the line we want to look at is knight to d2. Because at first glance, you might be thinking, wait, this queen has completely run out of moves. So keep that in mind when you play the Banco. You want to watch for sort of these typical themes. You get a position like this, always make sure that you have a way out for your queen when she's sitting on b3. And here we can tactically justify this move with knight takes c3. And that threatens a fork, king and queen. Um, so white actually cannot take our queen. That's going to give us an advantage. So let's say queen takes c3 by white. And here, even though we've talked about going for the queen trade, and it's a perfectly good move here, we decided that our recommendation is going to be queen to a4. 
because we think this will allow us to keep more pressure on the board and give white more chances to make a mistake before we cash in for the material. Yeah. So if you're happy with the draw, like, you know, go ahead. Just take the queen. This is just a very equal end game after like trades. Just it, it felt like when you were looking at this line that like everything just fell off the board. Yeah. Like there just wasn't really much play to it. Um, so if you're looking for a draw, then go for that. But Matt and I were looking for kind of a way to be more aggressive with black and have some more winning chances. So this is why we play this queen a4 move. Uh, it really kind of just keeps the pieces on the board and the pressure because this queen just stepped into the line of our bishop. So playing queen a4 actually helps us because now after we move this knight, his queen's going to be in trouble. So he kind of has to deal with this right now, which is why uh, white plays queen to d3 right away. And now that, you know, this knight is in the way and there's no longer this queen supported by the bishop and this whole battery, now we can play h6 and kick out this bishop. So again, normally they take, if they go to h4, we just play g5. So takes and then bishop takes. And now let's look at knight to c4 by white. And one point that I really like that you made, Justin, was you had the option in this line to go for a draw or play for a win. And as we were doing our research, there's quite a few lines like that where we found where we thought, okay, well, we want the course to be play for a win. So in our main PGN, it's going to be play for a win. But we have a lot of options to liquefy the position into like dead drawn end games too. Um, so if you're playing an opponent where you're higher rated or a draw really helps you in the standings, you got those options on the table. All right, so now let's see. After knight c4, we're going to play rook to b3. And again, this is because white played pawn to a3. We have that square available. Queen to c2 by white. And now we see this bishop come to d4. This is another common Benko idea. Once pieces start trading off, that bean keto bishop can come here. And now not only does he pressure b2, he also pressures the pawn on f2. So if knight to d2 is played, for example, there's actually a cool tactic. Rook takes a3, lining up the queens. So that snags a free pawn, and we still have a better pawn structure. Um, but let's look at rook f to c1 by white. That's the, the move we have in the course. Yeah, rook takes a3 is a really nice tactic. There's a ton of kind of tactical patterns that are really useful to know. Um, so hopefully we you know, do our best at pointing those out. Um, so if that happens in a game, you'll be prepared. So here, Black has a few options, but really what it comes down to is Black wants to improve his pieces on the queen side as best he can. And if he plays rook b8, it's just not super clear how he improves from there. Um, but with this plan, we play queen to b5. And now what we're trying to do is bring our rook to a4 and essentially put white in Zug's way. Because we have this pressure on the b2 pawn with the queen lined up. So this knight can't really move. And then if we put this rook on a4, now these pieces can't move because they're tied down to this knight. So suddenly all of white's pieces become tied down to either the b2 pawn or the c4 knight. So this kind of plan of playing queen b5 and rook a4 is really, really strong. And it puts a lot of uncomfortable pressure on white. So queen b5 is a really nice idea. And then after g3, just like I said, we play rook to a4. <laughs> Justin and I had a ton of fun looking at lines in this chapter. Um, we actually had like double the amount of lines that are in the main course. And we'll have content coming out later going through some of these. But this one in particular, I really liked because of that Zuxuang aspect. We were trying to, we're both national masters, and we were trying to find human moves for white. And then we would look at Stockfish for replies for black. And it would just like outplay us in every single line. We couldn't figure out what to do for white. Um, so let's go a little deeper here. We have king to g2, king to g7. And one thing that white has to watch out for is sometimes there's pressure on this f2 pawn. And there's also some crazy lines we looked at where this rook swings back to the h file and we throw this h pawn up the board and, and crack open the king side that way. So black's sort of controlling the whole board here. Feel free to be very creative in these positions. Uh, we looked at h4, h5. 
And here we looked at king to h3, which is a mistake, but we just wanted to show how white could fold in this position. We have rook to f3, minus three eval, because this pawn immediately drops, and this rook is tied down to the defense of the knight. So all of these white pieces are just stuck over there on the queen side, and we're saying, hey, we can attack king side and queen side at the same time. Yeah, it's just, it's a crazy position. I highly encourage you to just mess around with it. Um, Cause it was really cool to see how like it doesn't, it's not super clear how, how black breaks through here and kind of gets the win, but it's just, it's very interesting to look at because there's always kind of pressure with this, this F pawn and like in this position, it's already very, very difficult because we just said he can't move any of these pieces. And now he can't move his king because then the, the, the rook goes to f3. Yeah. So literally all of his pieces are tied out, um, which is just a really kind of crazy and cool idea that like this can happen just um, because we gambited a pawn in the opening. And normally um, you'd only see that in a king and pawn end game, right? Where you just completely run out of right? moves. Like there's four other pieces on the board and white can't move. <laughs> exactly. It's so cool. All right, so now let's go back to move 13. We just played rook f to b8, and we looked at rook a to b1. And now we get to look at one of my favorite setups for white when we're playing the black side, rook f to b1. I love seeing these two rooks tucked in the corner like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to play queen to b6, same idea as we looked at before, opening up this knight to b4 move. Most common move for white, you've probably guessed it, on to a3 softening up this b3 square. Um, they do get to prevent our knight jumping in. And now we have a new idea that we haven't looked at yet. This is another really common one. On to c4. So what's our idea here? Why are we taking this protected pawn and putting it to what seems like a vulnerable square? Because first off, it stops this pawn from moving. So there's no b4, b3, anything like that, um, because we can just take on b3. The second thing which I really love is this knight suddenly becomes uh, just a monster because it goes to c5. And then here it has the choice of either going to b3 or d3, which are both just fantastic squares. So this maneuver of knight c5 to b3 or d3 is just killer. Uh, so white really needs to do something about it. So what we're going to look at is bishop to e3. And then after knight c5, um, here, you know, because they have this pin, now we don't necessarily have knight p3 and knight d3 just yet. Um, so it's a little more awkward, but we have ways to work around. And you know, one thing I just realized when we were talking about these routes for the knights, I'm from Minnesota, and John Bartholomew's from Minnesota. He mm -hmm. used to play the Banco Gambit as his main weapon growing up. I don't know if you know this. Like he was on ICC crushing title players with the Benko. One thing that I like about watching John play, he's super strong with the knights. He always takes a knight versus a bishop and he's really good at maneuvering them. So I'm not saying correlation is causation, but he grew up playing the Benko and he's really strong with his knights. So there might be something going on there. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So let's go to queen to e2 by white. This targets our c pawn. Right? Simple queen takes c4, capture, but we do have a trick. We're going to play knight f to d7. So we get another knight move, opening up this bishop and gambiting the pawn on c4. Queen takes c4, and now we're going to play queen to a6. So we're just down two connected pass pawns. Um, and you might be thinking, isn't white just flat out winning this position? Uh, but what's going to happen, Justin, after queen takes a6 and rook takes a6? It's it's just incredible that, like, you can just be down two pawns, two, like, connected past pawns in an endgame, and it's the engine just says it's equal. And the reason this is so good for us is because, first off, we have all this pressure, again, that keyword pressure, um, on the queen side. And second, now we are ready to play something like knight to d3 or uh, knight to d3 even, because this bishop on d4 is really kind of the star 
um, and it can really come alive in a lot of positions. It's probably not a great idea, but like you can already start to think of moves like rook takes b2 and bishop takes c3 um, because, again, this bishop just creates so many opportunities and tactics. And again, like b4 is suddenly not on the table because this bishop and this pin, it's just really, really nasty. So this bishop is, is really the key piece. And if we get, can ever just plant this knight on b3, that's going to be actually, that's just going to trap the, the rook um on a2 which is just a hilarious square for the rook to be in. so uh the the really the idea here for black is just that all of our pieces are going to be very well placed and it's again it's kind of hard for white to move there's just not much to do so like for example if he plays let's say like knight d4 feels like a natural move um or like bishop d4 but already we just have takes, takes, and then knight to b3. Nice. And again, knight to b3 is kind of the idea. So there's just so many like tactics, so many ideas in this position um, that you really need to like dig deeper into to, to fully understand. But just the concept that we could be down two pawns in the end game and it would be zero, zero, zero is just ridiculous. Um, and it's just it's going to be a fun position to play because that means you have two pawns worth of compensation. So all of our pieces are going to be very, very happy. Yeah, these positions are so much fun. And just turn your tactical radar on. Keep looking for tactics. A lot of lines you have rook takes b2 right here. Rook takes back. You grab a knight and you're about to win your exchange back and the a pawn falls in the end. So you can pretty much get your pawns back no matter what. Now, let's go back to move 13. Um, so we were right here after knight takes a6. We looked at queen to c2. Um, that was trying to defend both of these pawns. But let's look at this move. It's not super common. But let's see what happens if white plays e5 immediately. And we're going to start with d takes e5, opening up the center. And after knight takes e5, don't play queen takes b2. That could trap your queen. After a combination of rook to b1 and knight to c4, the queen gets trapped. We're going to drop this queen back. Queen to b7. We're down one pawn. And now we have pressure on these two pawns, d5 and b2. So in these kinds of positions, because he's moved his e4 pawn, and this e4 pawn was protecting d5, our idea is kind of going to shift a little bit. This position is going to be different than a lot of the other Benko ideas that we talked about because he's played e5, and now this e5 pawn is weak. So in this kind of position, what we want to do is target this d5 pawn. So after, say, queen f3, now we just think, how can we attack this pawn? And we play knight to b4, um, which is a great square for the knight. You might be thinking, like, why not go to, like, c7 or something? But b4 is, is really, again, a great square because... It can it just does a ton of things at once. It can go and take on d5, it can hop from c2 to d4, and it also puts pressure on a2. So on b4, it's just more active, it's better placed, and you can kind of combine a few different ideas uh, with this knight to d4. Yeah, this is already feeling uncomfortable for white again, uh, even though they're up a pawn. So let's look at the most common move, bishop to e3. And we're going to focus on knight to c2. There is an option to take that pawn, so that goes more towards the drawage territory. We want to play active here. Knight c2, mm -hmm. hitting the rook. And after the rook moves, we can now play knight takes e3. We're simplifying down into an endgame in this line, but we think that the weaknesses for white are actually going to give pretty good winning chances. So let's say queen takes e3. We grab the pawn on b2. Uh, materials equal now. We have Two isolated pawns for white, only one for us. And after queen takes c5, we're back to down a pawn. We have a cool move here. Uh, what's our tactic? Here, because this bishop, again, this is the star of the Benko. Um, it's lined up with both of these knights. We just play knight to e4 here, which again, just looks crazy. <laughs> like, what in the world is, is that? But White has to take here because again, um, White has to take with knight 
takes e4 because this bishop on g7 is just a piece. So after knight takes e4, um, here our idea is we don't want to take here with the bishop because when white played queen takes e5, now white has this idea of also taking on e7. And this would be kind of really devastating if we lost this pawn because after bishop takes, queen takes, this d pawn becomes super strong. It's it's very close to queening and just causing a lot of problems for us. Uh, just a really uh, a pain for us. So that's why instead of bishop takes, we play queen six e five. And now we're protecting this e seven pawn backwards. And now we have this attack on the knight and the pawn on e two. So for example, something that might happen is rook to e1 and then rook takes a2. And again, there's a lot of different ways in the line that we looked at that we could have simplified into a drawn or drawish endgame. But we felt that this gave us the best winning chances because we have this active rook on the second rank, which is a huge plus. And we also have just this knight versus bishop imbalance and this d5 pawn, which is isolated. So there's just a lot more imbalances, a lot more dynamic play in this endgame that we just felt like the game's not over. Um, there's still a lot of chess to be played in this position, even though it looks pretty drawish. Um, because there are these imbalances in the position, we felt that this was uh, a good opportunity for Black to try to play for a win. And also keep in mind that we're on move 22 now. So there's a lot of ways for white to go wrong along the way. Um, so that's something where, okay, they might make it this far and get that equal position according to the engine, but like Justin said, we got imbalances to play with. All right, so now we're jumping all the way back to when we played queen a5 on move 8. We just looked at bishop to d2. Now let's take a look at knight to d2. Um, this move is going to be more common at higher ratings than at the club level. So we're giving it a few less lines in our main course. You can expect bonus content on this move. And we're here, we're going to play bishop takes a6. And let's see what happens here if white plays bishop takes a6. But then also we'll circle back and look at what happens if white plays bishop to e2. And they just say, hey, we're not going to trade. We're going to play bishop e2 in castle. But we'll start with bishop takes a6. So after bishop takes a6, just like we said, this whole idea of playing queen a5 is because after they take on a6, now we can take back the queen and cut off their castle. But you might be asking, why can't they just play queen e2 and then castle? And that's a very fair question. Uh, white plays queen e2 a lot in this position. It's the most common move. Um, but here, what we do is because the queen and king are both in the center, we try to take advantage of try to open up this e file and play e6 here. So this is another move that's kind of uh, a tendency breaker. Uh, it it's, doesn't really um, align with the main, like typical Banco ideas, but it's important to know why we play this and when we play it. So we play it after queen e2 because the queen and king are in the center and we want to try to open things up. Yes, so rookie eight is coming soon. e pawns are trading off. So let's say queen takes a6 by white. Um, oh, I should mention here, if d takes, we do have f takes. So if queen takes a6, we're going to take with the knight. And now white needs to deal with this idea again. e takes d, e takes d, and rook e8 check. So a lot of players do take here. We take back with the f pawn. And now our plan is knight to b4, and this knight is causing problems. Knight c2. Knight to d3, there's that rook in the corner that could be attacked. Obviously, the king could be checked. Um, so most players here are going to castle. And here we go. We're still going to go with it. Knight to b4, different looking position. Queen's off the board. But we're still coming with the initiative and trying to create threats. Yeah, exactly. This knight b4 move, just like in one of the other lines we looked at, is actually a very nice uh, idea. Because again, we can have this idea of transferring to d4, and it also has this pressure on a2. c6 is not a bad square. It's just a good square for a knight. It has a lot of options, a lot of ways to go. Um, so here, the most common move is a3. Uh, but a3 is actually 
a slight mistake because uh, it doesn't actually do anything. Um, because b takes a or sorry, a takes b4 would just hang the rook on a1. So white can't do that. So here now is our time. He's kind of neglected his development a little bit. So here we strike in the center with d5. So because we played e6, that's when d5 is going to have more venom to it. And that's when we kind of want to play for this d5 idea. Because again, this is kind of a tendency breaker. This is a move that we don't want to play as often. And I think in the course, like we looked at both of these lines, uh, d5 and knight to d3, we didn't end up choosing knight d3. But we have that d5 move in mind. Um, so now after knight to c4 by white, they're kind of trying to unwind the queen side. Like, can they figure out, how do we get that bishop out? How do we get that rook out? And what we're going to do here is we're going to play knight to g4. And now we have both knights and our rook all targeting this pawn on f2. Uh, so we got a triple attack here. And also keep in mind, there's this bishop to d4 check. Uh, so for example, this is not in the course, but if f3, bishop d4 check followed by knight check, Black is completely winning, so feel free to explore that one on your own. But we're going to look at 17 h3 by white, which isn't much better. I'll let you show this tactic, Justin. <laughs> so again, because we have this knight on d3 and knight on g4, our knights are super active and super strong. And just like always, our bishop on g7 is the key player. So after knight g takes f2, this is... The, the critical move, the, the way to kind of punish uh, white in this position after um, if like if rook takes f2, we would just take back. So that's not really something we need to worry about um, because again, we have three attackers on that square. So kind of the critical idea would be to um, hard to say i mean white's still pretty tied down <laughs> yeah no i don't really see what i guess bishop to e3 would be uh the critical move kind of putting more pressure here yeah but in this case we could just kind of simplify uh so an idea here might be to take on c3 and then take on e4 um because that kind of just like we we grabbed a pawn on f2 so like we're okay with simplifying now um, but we do need a way to get this knight back. So th this is why this is the most critical line, because we need to be able to take on e4, because right now this knight is trapped, actually. So uh, something like bishop takes e3 and then knight takes e4 would give us uh, a much better position. Yeah, I really like these lines. Um, and when you get into those tactical positions like that, where it's hard to find a move for white, sometimes when you're reviewing these notes, flip the board either in your mind or, you know, go on chess.com and click flip or chess space and try to find a move for white um, and then see what the engine says for black. And you'll find that like a lot of these positions, it's just every move is a mistake for white if they don't play one of the top one, two or three choices because we have the initiative. Um, so now let's go back to move 15. It's exactly. a great point. Knight b4. Let's look at knight to c4 here. What are we going to do in this case? So knight to c4 here, this is where we play d5 right away because, again, we, we play d5 here instead because it, we just have this tempo against the knight, so it makes more sense to do it here. Um, and now after takes and takes, white usually plays knight to b6. If knight to d2, that's just, okay, it's a really hard move for white to play. It's just to go back to d2. Yeah. So knight c4... Uh, looks very appealing at first, but the more you look at it, like it's actually a mistake. But knight c4 is a common move that a lot of club players play. So after this, a lot of people play knight to b6, and this actually just makes their position a lot worse. Um, so what does black do here? now? We're going to play rook to a6, attacking the knight, and the knight is almost trapped. And here, so we like to show at the club level, what are you most likely to see in your games? Here, most players play pawn to a3, and this is another mistake. Um, and what we're going to do here is we're going to play knight to c2, attacking the rook. And when the rook moves, now our knight is safe, right? It's not being attacked by the pawn. We can simply play rook takes b6. We are completely winning. Um, we just won that knight. 
We got two strong pawns in the center and the eval is over minus four. So the computer is saying you're almost up the equivalent of a rook, even though it's two points on the board. Yeah, this looks great. So I think it's important if they go back to um, instead of a3, if they play, say, knight b to a4, this isn't much better. It's it's still better because they're not down a full piece. But this just center, like, if we're just looking at this position, black's pieces are just very well placed. So if we just do something simple, just like, knight just protect this pawn on c5. Right, yeah, just knight d7. Now, all of a sudden, this center, like, usually white has the center. But now we have the center because we have these beautiful pawns and all of our pieces are in gray squares. It's it's just very, very difficult for white to play. Again, just like Matt said, um, try to flip the board every once in a while and, and just come up with a move for white because it's very difficult in a lot of these lines. And his knights are just stepping over each other. This knight can come to d3. And it's just, it's it's really, really hard to play for white. And we're threatening d4 here, kicking the knight that defends this knight. If white plays a move like b3, now there's a tactic alert. Rook <laughs> takes a4 because the bishop lines up with the knight and the rook. So again, it's just tactic after tactic. I agree with what you said, Justin. Flip the board again. Try to play from the white side. Um, you'll see how much fun they're having. <laughs> <laughs> so let's now yeah. go back to move 10. So right here, we had just played bishop takes a6. And we'll have timestamps for these lines um, in the course. Now, instead of bishop to e2, let's, or sorry, instead of bishop takes a6, let's look at bishop to e2, where white says, all right, I'm just going to try to castle quickly. And what we're going to do here is just a useful quiet move on to d6, preparing to bring our knight into the game. We're not in a rush to take on e2. Right, exactly. This d6 move is, again, a very, very common move just vacating the square for a knight. So here, white usually castles. And here, we kind of have this debate whether to play knight b to d7 or knight f to d7. And I feel like most people just want to bring this piece to d7 because they haven't moved it. And, you know, that follows the opening principles. That makes a lot of sense. But here, we actually want to play knight f to d7. And the reason is here we need this bishop to be open to put pressure on c3 because this pressure on c3 in this specific line is a lot harder to deal with because he's played knight to d2. Normally, they could just play bishop to d2, and that wouldn't be a big deal. But now um, it's something that, that black has to watch out for. So that's why we play knight f to d7. And here, white plays bishop takes a6. And I really like that memory point of the knight coming back to d2, knowing when to put this knight on d7. Here we're going to play knight takes a6, renewing our threat of bishop takes c3. And after knight to c4, we have this favorite square for our queen, queen to b4, and she's eyeing this, she's eyeing the knight, she's eyeing this pawn, she's eyeing this knight, um, queen to e2 by white, trying to hold everything at the same time. And now we go with one of our common plans. Let's try to swap off a pair of knights. We're going to play knight to e5. And you might be thinking, why aren't we playing bishop takes c3 here? Why don't we try to win that pawn? Well, sometimes you want to make sure you have enough of an advantage. And you also want to make sure that white doesn't get counterplay. So for example, if we take, take, queen takes, maybe that bishop gets on the diagonal and all of a sudden our dark squares are really weak. So we're going with knight e5 here, trying to get that knight trade in. Yeah, that's a great point. Anytime we, we trade off this dark square bishop, if white's bishop gets on this diagonal, it's super strong. Mm -hmm. So that's something we want to avoid if possible. Um, so again, knight e5 makes a lot of sense trying to trade off the knights, which is, again, a common idea in the medgo. So white takes, and we take with the bishop. And now this provokes a slight mistake. A lot of people play f4 here, and that it usually... It's just a very natural move when this bishop's here to try to kick it out. Um, but it actually is it's a pretty weakening move. So here we play bishop to d4 check, taking advantage of this weakened diagonal since he plays f4. So then king h1. 
And now here's kind of a, a point where we need to come up with a plan. We need to figure out how to improve the rest of our position, the, the rest of our pieces. So here, something like rook f to b8 would make sense. But the best way, the best plan for black here is to play c4. So this is kind of a weird looking move because a lot of times when you have a bishop on an outpost or really any piece on an outpost, it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to push the pawn that was protecting it. But this creates a lot of play on its own because again, we have this knight coming to c5. And even in this line, it can come to b3 um, because this a pawn is pinned to the rook. So b3 or d3, um, we just need to improve this knight. That was our piece that, that really needs to be improved. So this is why we play c4. I like. And now, go ahead. I was going to say, I like when white pushes any of their pawns. Every time they push a pawn, I'm <laughs> thinking, where are the weaknesses? Um, but there is an upside to this pawn push. White wants to play a really quick f5. And I think that factors in a little bit to our decision to play c4 as well. Because if we play too slowly, or if we move that rook over to the queen side, and we see f5, we might not be ready to face it. But c4, like Justin mentioned, that gives us this really quick route for the knight. Um, we're able to get that counterplay. So let's say f5 for white anyways. We're going to go knight to c5. We're looking at this idea still. You know, maybe we can play it at the right time. And after bishop to h6, I had to show this line, Justin. The bishop <laughs> is attacking the rook on f8, right? We're already down one point. Do we want to drop two more points by allowing bishop takes f8? Yes, we do. Yeah. We're going to play knight to d3. Just going back to that whole theme, adding pressure and eyeing knight takes b2. And again, it's super, super hard for white to come up with any moves. Because uh, this b2 pawn is attacked, and it's very difficult to, to try to stop it. So first off here, white takes on f8. If they don't take on f8, it doesn't really help. <laughs> but um, so this is the move we're going to look at because it's the most critical, and it's the best move for white. So bishop takes f8. We play king takes because we want this rook to stay on this nice open file. And then usually they take on g6. So we have to deal with these, these captures first before we can have any of our fun on the queen side. But takes, h takes. And then here, the move we're going to look at is knight to d1. Uh, knight to d1, we think, makes the most sense because, again, all this pressure on b2, this would be another great position to just try to look at it from white's perspective and, and see all the ways you can go wrong because there's a lot of ways you can go wrong here. Uh, because of all the pressure on this this knight and, and b2. Um, so here, again, knight d1 is the move. So now we have king to g7. And <laughs> this king is surprisingly safe. He stole the Fiancato square from that bishop. But it also opens up ideas of maybe swinging the rook across to h8 to attack this king that can't move. It can't go to g1 currently. So now let's say a3 by white. Well, what does that do? Opens up the b3 square. We're going to take advantage of it. Queen to b3. And like Justin keeps mentioning, try to find a move for white. Um, it's really difficult here. They're very tied down, so rook b1 looks natural. Now we have rook takes a3. A little tactic. This pawn is pinned down. Um, white could take, but we'll take on b1 with the queen. And at this point, the computer says 0, 0.00. But if you look at the material count, white is plus two currently. If you look at the position, I would take black here all day long. Um, I do not want to play the white position here. We're going to play f6. That secures the center, blocks out this e pawn. Um, we're most likely going to win the b pawn, and then we have the pass c pawn to push up the board. I don't know. What do you think of this position? Would you take white or black? Oh, I, absolutely, I would take black. It's just so much easier to play because you're the one forcing the issue. You're the one making the threats. And white just has to react. And that's just not a fun way to play chess. If you're just reacting to your opponent's moves, that's it's super easy to make a mistake. So that's why this position is, you know, even though it says zero, 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 practically, this is a much better position for black. It's so much easier to play. So it's not a, a London 0.00 is what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, we got two lines left. 
This chapter has some of the longest lines in the course just because our, our main branching point is move eight. And also, you're going to see these lines at a higher rating level. So your opponents are going to be more prepped. So I wanted to go quite a bit deeper. So you compare this to like the London chapter, the Queen Pawn chapter. These lines go much deeper. That's why. Um, now let's look mm -hmm. at bishop to d3 on move nine. We just put our queen on a5. This is trying to reinforce this pawn. This is a mistake, and it's a very common one. So we're, sh we're showing this because this is not a grandmaster lifetime repertoire course made for international masters. This is a course made for club level players up to master level. This is a club level mistake. How do we punish bishop to d3? Yeah, this bishop d3 move makes a lot of sense. Just they're trying to cover this. Like, it's just a very natural move to make, but it allows this move. Knight takes d5. Again, I've, I've been saying this over and over again. This bishop on g7 is the star. It's the piece that causes all of these tactics. And, and after pawn six, our idea is we just take on c3 with the bishop. And here, most players take here, but it's actually not the best move. The best move is to block on d2, which again, it's very counterintuitive. No one, no one wants to block on d2. People just want to take and sacrifice. So after takes, we just take here and our idea here is we're going to win this rook on a1 with this fork so for example uh queen d2 if, if for example if bishop d2 what this does is it cuts off the connection between the queen and the bishop so we can just take this bishop and this is just a super uncomfortable position for for white i i'm just already imagining this bishop <laughs> coming to a6 and just all of white's pieces being stuck again um so queen d2 and now we just take this rook on a1 and the reason i wanted to show this line it looks like oh white just blundered the exchange like maybe they didn't see it i think this is a line you may face when white is an aggressive player they're sacrificing that rook in the corner to get this dark squared bishop knowing that ours is off the board so i wanted to show you how do you win that rook and still consolidate here and get the win so we're going to play after castle, we're going to play queen back to g7. This is an important move. We tuck her away safely, because bishop to b2 is coming. We also guard the h6 square, so white's queen isn't going to come in there. And after this next move, bishop to b2, we now have f6. We fianchettoed our queen, and we're creating this little pawn fortress uh, up two points. So pawn to f6, everything is solid. Um, Let's say d6, though, for white. Can white crack our structure here? No. So d6 looks really good, because if we take on d6, all of a sudden, bishop c4, and the two bishops here are looking very, very nice on these two long diagonals. So we don't want to take here. What we want to do is just block that diagonal and play e6. And this looks kind of funny with our three pawns like this, but it's actually very solid and very strong. We're up two points of material. And the rest of our pieces are going to come out very, very quickly. Uh, we're going to take on a6 next. And uh, again, our pieces just, are just going to come out very quickly. So it doesn't really matter right now that, that we don't have all our pieces developed. And if something like, uh, say, knight g5 might look a little scary with the, this pin here, um, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> like it's not, it's not threatening anything. So once we have this set up, we're, we're super solid. So we just wanted to show this line because we thought it was important. There were a few ways that we could go wrong here. But once we get to this point, um, white usually plays rook c1. And now, you know, he's putting pressure here. So we take back this way. So if he wants to grab this pawn, we're saying, go ahead. You know, you can do this, but you're going to lose the two bishops. Yeah. Um, so we're going to be pretty happy. And, you know, in the end, we could potentially be winning here. Um, but regardless, uh, taking on a6 is just bad. So in this position, the eval is around minus 1.5. Again, we're up, or now we just took this pawn, so we're up three points in material. Um, so our, our plan here is just to go rook b8, bishop to b7, and just look to simplify, look for trades to make this position easier to play for us. But it, it shouldn't be too um, uncomfortable. Once Again, once we have the setup, we're pretty solid. There's not really a way for white to put more pressure. 
It almost feels weird recommending a line in this course where we don't have the initiative. It's the only <laughs> line we've seen this chapter, so it's kind of, we're both kind of like, ah, oh, White's got these two strong bishops, but we know that this position is solid, and you'll you'll be able to get out of it just fine. Other rooks coming into the game. Um, knight on f3 is not a great piece. So yeah, that minus one point eval, minus one point five eval, would hopefully hold true. And now we got one line left. Last line of the chapter, Justin. It's move eight. We're gonna look at e5. So if white immediately attacks our knight, we only have one move. So like Justin talked about, that's why we had to castle. So we can put our knight back on e8. And we're gonna be thinking knight reroutes again. That knight's gonna figure out how to come into the game soon. Exactly. So this knight on e8, again, it looks weird, but it's gonna to head to c7 and put pressure on the center. So e5 is a very common like club level move, so it's important to look at this line. Uh, here we're going to look at f4. White has some other options, but they're not super um, challenging and they're not played as much. So f4 is kind of the move we're going to look at. And now we put more pressure on the center and we play d6. Um, e6 is never really a move now because we can just take and then take with a bishop. Um, so usually when they play e6, it's to weaken this diagonal, um, but it doesn't weaken the diagonal because we can put a bishop on e6. But guess what? Most common so, move at the club level on to e6 here. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so after e6, we should be very happy. We just take, and and we should just be better. So. Um, oh, I was looking awesome. at the next move. Sorry, I was looking at the next move. <laughs> Knight f3 first, sorry. <laughs> Knight f3 first. 97 and now e6. So now e6 makes more sense because after pawn takes, pawn takes, we can't take with the bishop, but this is still going to be good for us because we just play knight to f6. Again, we do this because we want this knight to go to c7. And now that this pawn's on e6, c7 actually becomes an even better square because now it's it works very well in attacking this e6 pawn. So the most common move for white here is bishop to c4. And I'm looking at this position, and I see the f pawn up, I see the e pawn all the way on e6. I'm just thinking these are targets, and they're creating other avenues for us to attack. We're going to play knight to c7 here. This pawn is now double attacked. This pawn is triple attacked. So white is plus two on material. The eval, though, is minus one. So what that means is we actually have three pawns worth of compensation on the board which is a lot of pawns of comp. And our plan, we're not going to look to immediately capture one of these back. We're going to look to play pawn to d5, pawn to d4, and utilize this past d pawn, which really just wants to keep marching up the board and causing problems. And then later on, we can round up these pawns by white. But I'm really liking this minus one eval, considering we're down <laughs> two points of material. What do you think? I, I completely agree. It, this kind of position, it feels a little uncomfortable, but I encourage you to kind of work through it a little bit, try to play around with it, because the more you play with it, the more you realize, like, from here on out, it's going to be, like, we're going to have the initiative. Like, it seemed like White was kind of forcing the issue with, like, E6 and E5, but now that we've gotten this position, even though we're down material, now... This is when we play d5. We're gonna all of these pawns are weak too, so we, we could probably take them back, and we're gonna have a lot of play. Um, once we play d5, that immediately just uh, improves our position tremendously uh, because we have a lot more space and we're just controlling the center uh, a lot better. So once we play d5, uh, we should be set. And I think one thing that holds true for both chapters one and two, especially in this course. Play a ton of games. Get a lot of practice in, even blitz chess. Um, you want to play a ton of bankos. And what's going to happen is you're going to just start to really learn all these different positional ideas, all these maneuvers, tactics, ways to apply pressure. And you're going to be so much more comfortable than your opponent. And it's not actually going to come down to memorizing moves. It's going to just come down to who knows these positions better. And that's where you're going to have a lot of fun. Um, so that concludes mm -hmm. chapter one. Banco double accepted E4. It's going to be one of our longer chapters. Uh, it was a little over an hour. And we'll see you guys in chapter two, where White Ian Kettles, the Kingside Bishop with G3.